So let's uh, actually get going on class. We talked last time about kind of the abstract idea of asymplectic manifold, but we didn't really talk about any interesting examples. Essentially, the only example we talked about was thinking about like the phase space of a particle moving around an RN, um, where both the position and the momentum are represented by elements of RN. Now there's a sort of important generalization of that, which is that you can consider the cotangent bundle of any manifold. Um, so secretly, when you think of position and momentum in Rn, really that momentum is secretly a co-vector. Um, and this has to do with how you transform under coordinates, but I, I promise you that's the right thing. And kind of one of the pieces of evidence is if a particle is moving around an arbitrary manifold, M, the way to sort of describe that phase space is to look at T star of M. So uh, I'm not assuming you are totally comfortable with the idea of a cotangent bundle. So let me first just talk about that as an abstract thing. So I, I am assuming you're comfortable with the idea of a tangent space to a manifold at a point. And hopefully you've encountered the tangent bundle, which is all the tangent spaces together. Well, the cotangent bundle is what happens when you dualize each of those spaces. So at each point, there's a dual to the tangent space. Um, and that's sometimes called the cotangent space. Let me give myself a little room and add a comment about that. And of course I lost my star. You don't, yeah. One note is a little annoying about getting this stuff to work out correctly. All right. Um, so let me just comment because I'll say this sometimes. This is the cotangent space. And the sort of important thing to think about the cotangent space is it's where, um, where the differential of a function lives. So where df evaluated at a particular point. So df kind of evaluated at some point. Um, oh, thought I had been careful about this, but apparently I wasn't. I'll try to follow the book and use x for the base of a, uh, a cotangent bundle and m for the symplectic manifold res uh, resulting from it. So it's going to require a few changes, but so if I take the differential of a function and I evaluate that at a point, that's a covector. And the way I can see that is a vector has a directional derivative at a point. So a function, I can feed that in, have it eat that, get hit by that directional derivative, and that spits out a number. So the pairing between a vector and the differential of a function is just what happens when I take that function and I take derivative with respect to that vector. That's what this L here means. This will come up next week. This is called Lie derivative. But I mean, this is just thinking of the tangent vector as a directional derivative. All right, <coughs> excuse me. So when I take all the cotangent spaces at all the different points of the manifold and take their union, then I get what's called the cotangent bundle. But describing it like that, it's not obvious that it even is a topological space, let alone it's actually a manifold. And I sort of know how the topology should work in each of the fibers because it's a real vector space and every finite dimensional real vector space has a canonical topology and in fact manifold structure that comes from any norm or any choice of linear coordinates. Um, and I sort of know that along the base, 
I should get the manifold structure of the original manifold, but how do I kind of glue those together? I have to be able to tell you what it means that points in two different cotangent fibers are close to each other, right? Um, or more generally kind of what coordinates on uh, the cotangent bundle would look like. And this is not hard. Art, I think it's going through if you haven't thought about cotangent bundles before. And if you have, I apologize, I won't take that long. So it's worth thinking first about the case where my manifold is an actual vector space. So I could say Rn, but I might as well say vector space because I like abstract vector spaces better. So in this case, the tangent space at every point is the original vector space. So the cotangent space is the dual vector space. The, so the, the cotangent space at every point, they're all canonically identified with each other. I'm using the linear space structure when I do that. It's not true for general manifolds. So actually the cotangent bundle is just the direct sum of the original vector space and the dual vector space. All right. And because it, now my whole cotangent bundle can be thought of as a vector space, that gets a manifold structure if I just choose any linear coordinates, right? Choose a basis that gives you an isomorphism to Rn. Rn is by definition a manifold. All right. And then we just use that. Well, by definition, a manifold is something that's covered by open subsets of Rn, right? So if I have an open subset of my manifold and an embedding of that into Rn, then I can think of the cotangent bundle of the open subset U as a subset of the cotangent bundle. And I can put a chart on that piece of the cotangent bundle by looking at the induced map from T star of U into T star of R. All right, so now T star of U, originally that was just a set, right? I just take the cotangent uh, spaces at each of the points in U, I take their union, that's just a set, but now I'm saying, oh no, I've embedded it into T star Rn, and it's I want the topology that comes from embedding it in Rn that way, and in fact, the manifold structure that comes from embedding it in Rn that way. All right, and I just sort of use this fact that I already know that T star of Rn is R2n, and I know what the manifold structure on there is. So obviously there's a little bit of work in checking, oh, is that really okay? Um, somehow the important point is that when I have, so the, the thing I need to think about is my original manifold structure tells me, okay, I can take an open set, subset, I can embed it into Rn. Maybe I can do that in multiple ways or have two open subsets embedded in Rn and I have to compare them on the overlap. And the important point is the transition function from an open subset of Rn to an open subset of Rn has to be smooth. And I know what that means because I know what a smooth map from Rn to Rn is. And so I just have to check, oh, if my original transition functions on the original manifold are smooth, then the induced maps for the cotangent bundle are also smooth. And that requires writing a few formulas, but I hope it's pretty easy to believe. All right, are there any questions? Okay, like I say, this is sort of stuff that in theory should be background for the course, but cotangent bundles are really important as examples. So I wanna make sure you, you understand what they are. So an important thing about this is that the cotangent bundle is a vector bundle. So that means that Fibers are vector spaces in the obvious way. They're defined as co-vector spaces, um, cotangent spaces. And it's locally trivial over a small open subset around any point. I can identify all the fibers and my vector bundle just becomes the base, the open subset of the base times uh, an original vector space. Well, and I already argued that up here. Right, I exactly defined things. So this T star view, right? This map here actually gives me an isomorphism. Oops, ah, shoot. Um, T star view is isomorphic to 
Rn times U. So if I take any cover of uh, X by subsets which embed into Rn, open subsets that embed into Rn, then I'll, that's also a cover that trivializes the cotangent bundle. All right. Part of the reason I'm discussing this vector bundle structure explicitly is there's a really important thing we want to think about in vector bundles, which is sections. Um, so by definition, sections, these come up many places in mathematics, a section, this just means I have a map from E to B. In this case, it's a vector bundle, but you can apply the terminology in other situations, is a map backwards from the base to the bundle, which when I compose them, go up from the base to the bundle and then come back down, I end up at the same place in the base. So what this means is over each point in the base, I'm choosing a point in the fiber over that guy. And by thinking of it as a map, I get to ask questions like, did I do this in a smooth way? Did I do this in a continuous way, etc. So that's kind of the big advantage of thinking about it as a map is I already know what a smooth map is or a continuous map is. And so I can just ask, oh, well, I chose a point in every fiber. Did I do that in a smooth way? All right, so this is a really useful notion in differential geometry and algebraic geometry, lots of places. Um, for example, the kind of abstract definition of a vector field is it's a section of the tangent bundle. And the abstract definition of a one form is that it's a section of the cotangent bundle. So if you ever find yourself wondering what a one form is, by definition, it's something which at each point assigns a cotangent vector in a way which is continuous, smooth, whatever adjective you want to put on it. Uh, similarly, a K form. So, uh, oh, whoops, I made a mistake here. Uh, the cotangent bundle, as with any vector bundle, I can take wedge powers of it, right? I can look at each fiber, replace that fiber with the wedge power. And, you know, because of functional reality, I can use the same transition functions to define a wedge power bundle. And a K form is a section of that bundle. Um, more generally, if you, you know, for example, did need general relativity or something, you probably heard about a tensor of type Km. And if you talk to physicists, they'll tell you something horrible about con covariant and contravariant indices and blah, blah, blah. What they're really telling you is you have to take K factors of the tangent bundle, M factors of the cotangent bundle, tensor those all together. And of course, again, I mean fiber-wise tensor product. So this is a vector bundle whose fiber over each point is the tensor product of K factors of the tangent bundle at that point, the tangent space at that point, and M factors of the cotangent space. Yes, Josh. Do you want Joshua or Josh? Uh, I guess either sign. I usually go by Josh, but that's fine. Okay. Um, so uh, you mentioned something about functoriality uh, of like exterior powers and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, is the cotangent bundle exactly a functorial? Because I think there, there's issues because if like you have a, a map between smooth manifolds that doesn't necessarily give a, a map of bundles between cotangent bundles, right? Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's not what I meant, right? Okay. What I meant is, when you have a map between linear spaces, okay. you get a map between their exterior powers. Okay. So the cotangent bundle you can think of as kind of glued together by the transition functions that come when you change coordinates, right? And you know exactly the difference, be, I'm now even forgetting what the terminology in physics is, but I think it's covariant and contravariant, right? The difference between you know, one zero form and a zero one form is that taking dual is functorial, right? And okay, you yeah. are using the induced maps between the dual spaces. Um, I mean, there's probably a fancier word than I needed to use there, but 
you know, you have to do some small amount of thinking to like, yeah. why is it that if you have a vector bundle, you can take the wedge power uh, fiber wise and still get something that's well defined as a manifold, right? That's mm -hmm. like, if you haven't done that at some other point, that's a good exercise to think about, right? Um, you know, somehow the important thing here is the local triviality of the vector. Right? Yeah. That it's kind of obvious how to do that with a trivial bundle. And then you just have to make sure that everything kind of glues correctly when you try to put them all together, having done that wedge power on uh, a trivializing open cover. Okay, but you're, you're absolutely right that it's a huge nuisance and it will come up many times, uh, especially in this lecture, but probably in some future ones, that cotangent bundle is not a functor in quite the right way. Precisely as you say, because of this, like um, uh, tangent vectors push forward, co vectors pull back, and that's well. Sometimes it's a huge nuisance, but but it's you know it's what they do. So we just gotta gotta deal with it and move on for our move on with our lives. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Since I've paused. Oh, yeah. Sorry if I lowered your hand prematurely. No? Okay. Um, oh, right. I actually did have a question. Yeah. Um, so for um, these sections that we're talking about, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a map from our manifold into our bundle. Is that, is yes. that right? Yes. Okay. Right. So, so in this case, E is our manifold. Uh, no, E no, is no. the bundle. So, um, sorry. So, for example, let me, yeah, I, I wrote it out here, right? A, a vector field is a map from the original manifold, which I said I would change to being X, um, X into the tangent bundle of X that sends each point to a point and a vector, a vector in that tangent space, right? So this guy V is in the tangent space of the point small x. Okay. And this section condition is exactly just saying that I don't have some weird map from base to base. I'm not sending x to a tangent vector at some other point in the manifold. I'm sending it to one at that point x. Just kind of a, a convenient way of packaging that up to, to say that the composition with the projection map is the identity. Right. right, so here I apply the projection map. So this is what I was calling sigma. So I apply the projection map and I go back to this point x. Yeah. So for all these examples, we're just, for every single point we're associating a yeah. family of vectors and a family of uh, like co-vectors or elements of the kth wedge power of the co-vector okay. space, um, sorry, the cotangent space, um, okay. you know, elements of this big tensor product, et cetera. Okay. Great. All right. Any other questions? So the cotangent space has this kind of interesting structure on it, which is called the tautological one form. Um, and I'll just say like, this is a, a general kind of usage from well, kind of moduli theory of whenever you have a space whose points are some kind of object, you should be able to build kind of a family where over each point you put the object that you're thinking about. So T star of M is a space whose points are cotangent vectors. And so you should be able to put a family of cotangent vectors on it, which is a one form where each point corresponds to the cotangent vector that it is. Um, and we'll, 
uh, I'll explain this slightly more rigorously in a moment. So, right, what do I mean? Well, for every smooth one form, that's a new, I know my news and my gammas can look surprisingly similar. Each smooth one form new can be thought of as a section, a map from my original manifold to the cotangent bundle. All right, and it turns out that there is a unique one form, which I'll call alpha, such that if I take that one form alpha, I pull it back by the map sigma, as we just discussed a moment ago, co-vectors pull back, right? So whenever I have a one form on T star of X, and I have a map into T star of X, I can pull back the one form by that. Um, and so this is the, the, uh, the snake eating its own tail. I use the one form new to construct this map. I pull back the tautological one form by it and I get back my original one form. All right, so there are other ways to kind of try to define the tautological one form, but this is to me kind of the important thing to keep in mind. So when you think of the one form as a map, and you pull back the tautological one form by it, you get the one form you started with and used to construct the map. And this is, you know, sort of a very common kind of phenomenon in moduli theory. Um, uh, ben, yes. Uh, just to clarify the statement. So uh, alpha is a section of the cotangent bundle of the cotangent bundle, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So what alpha is, you are absolutely right. It's a map from T star of X thought of as a normal old manifold into T star of T star of X. And you know, somehow the, this looks weird, but somehow the reason that there's a like kind of obvious thing here is that you're, you're really kind of taking something that's, well, it's not quite a functor, but it's functor-ish and kind of applying it twice. Um, so I'm sure you could probably say some fancy word about monads or something, but it's also a very concrete thing, right? Um, so there's kind of two ways to think about this. I could try to just like write it down in coordinates, which, you know, is a very reasonable thing to do. Um, and I don't know, maybe it would be better, but I kind of want to think about assuming, you know, how do I kind of try to construct something like this? Well, I just said, oh, I'll write it down in coordinates. But of course, I'm not going to have global coordinates on my manifold. So I have to think about how these are related for different manifolds. Um, the kind of way that will be very reasonable precisely because of this point about the functors going the wrong way is what if I have an open embedding? What if X is an open submanifold of some X prime? Then in that case, the cotangent bundle really is going to be functorial. I am going to have an induced map from T star of X to T star of X prime. And the reason that is, is that well, I can look at plain old derivative. So that maps me in the correct direction. But because I have an open embedding, I get an isomorphism of tangent spaces. So for each point in, oh, kind of starting to regret this change of notation, but it will do me good. It will remind me to be careful about this in the future. So for each point in X, I can map it into X prime. There's an open subset around this point that just maps to an open subset isomorphically to an open subset in X prime. And so I get an isomorphism of tangent spaces. So to get a map the right direction in terms of cotangent spaces, I dualize that map. It goes the wrong way now, but I can invert it. So I'm gonna use 
capital I to mean the map on cotangent spaces that now goes the right direction. But making sure it goes the right direction requires taking an inverse of the kind of natural direction it should go. So cotangent bundles don't transform the right way under all maps, but they transform the right way under local, local diffeomorphisms. Or more generally, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's the right way to say it, local diffeomorphisms. All right. So now I actually do have a diagram where I have my original manifold X, I have the bigger guy that it sits inside, I have their cotangent bundles, I have maps in both directions along both guys. And now I wanna think about what happens when I take a one form on the bigger manifold and restrict it to the smaller one, right? So if I have a one form on the bigger manifold, then that gives me this, let me change my color because I've been using red a lot, the sigma prime. Uh, yeah, Benjamin or Ben, I don't know. Uh, hi, yeah, Ben. Um... So you, you mentioned that it behaves well under local diffeomorphisms. So the, would this theorem that you mentioned be a generalization to that, to any open embedding? It behaves well under any open embedding? Uh, well, an open embedding is locally a diffeomorphism. Okay. Right? So, um, yeah, the, right, the important thing I need is that the map on tangent spaces is an isomorphism. Right. Um, I guess if you want to, you can call atoll. I don't think differential geometers say that quite often, but that is what atoll means. Um, but in particular, an open embedding has that property. Okay, yeah. thanks. At every point in the source, it, uh, the map to the corresponding tangent space is an isomorphism. You have to watch out for things like, uh, what if I took a non-trivial cover? you know, in the, in the topological sense of my manifold, right? At every point upstairs, that would look like an isomorphism. It would be a diffeomorphism on some open subset around each point on my domain. But if I looked in the codomain and looked at a pre-image, I would see there was a problem. Um, so you just have to be careful about all of these words. I, But somehow the important property I want is at every point in the domain, I get an isomorphism on tangent spaces. Right. That's, okay. yeah. that's what I need to kind of turn this map on the cotangent bundle back in the, in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. All right. So sorry, what, uh, I was starting to explain this diagram and say, okay, if I have a one form on my bigger manifold, that gives me a map from X prime to T star X prime. Um, and when I restrict that to my smaller manifold, I, I also get a one form on the smaller guy. That gives me a map from X to T star X. And then I get this diagram which commutes. I can either do the inclusion uh, and then map up by the section corresponding to the one form on the bigger guy or I can map up and then do the inclusion. And I'll note here somehow the, the natural direction, right, is that there would be a map going back the other way here. And I would get the relation that the section corresponding to this smaller guy is gotten by going to the bigger guy, going up and then coming back. So that's the commutative diagram I would have for any map. And I use the fact that I have an open embedding to turn this arrow around. All right, now I think about what would happen if I had a, I'm oh, sorry, uh, 
And Ben, do you still have a question? Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, as I said, it's mostly just that like a hand rises to the top and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's slightly insistent, which is fine. It's good. I'm glad to see when people have questions, but um, slightly distracting if they don't. Okay. So what happens here? If I have on um, this guy, a tautological one form, a prime, the fact that I'm going for it is I can pull it back by this map I and I'll get a tautological one form on the smaller guy. And this set of equations tell you why that's so. So by the definition of a tautological one form, if I pull back by sigma prime, alpha prime, I get uh, my new prime. I think I probably at some point switched from doing gamma <laughs> news to doing gammas. Yeah. Well, that was pretty gamma-ish. All right. Well, obviously I can't can't tell the difference. Um, so if instead I pulled all the way back to x along one side of the square, well, I would get my new, right? The pullback of new prime by the map i is new. But on the other hand, now I'm finding that I could also pull back the other direction, pull back by i and then pull back by sigma. And so I find that the pullback by sigma of the pullback by i of a prime is equal to new. And that exactly tells me that i star of alpha prime, which I define to be alpha, is a tautological one form on the smaller guy. Okay, so I just sort of wrote the sentence here. Thus, it's enough to describe the tautological one form on Rn. So why is that? Let me just like say one sentence about why that's true. So if I have my manifold X, I can cover that by open subsets UI, which have embeddings into RN as open subsets. Um, and if I have a one form on X, it's uniquely determined by its pullbacks to all the UIs, right? So if um, new and new prime are one forms on X, new equals new prime, if and only if, the restriction of new and new prime to each one of these open subsets are equal, right? Um, and uh, I can glue together a one form. Yeah, it's maybe not even the most important part. What I'm actually using here is that sections form a sheaf. So, You'll sometimes see this written as like, so make a one, that's a way of, of saying the space of one forms. So if I have omega one, um, I have a natural map into the direct sum over all the i's of omega one ui. And then there's a map into the one forms on all of the pairwise intersections. And what's true, ooh, let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, is that this sequence is exact. So 
this is what's called the sheaf condition. Okay, so this statement I made about if you agree on open subsets, you agree on the whole thing, that's injectivity of this map. So exactness at this point. Um, and the other fact I need is if I have an element here that's sent to zero. So what this map here to the double overlaps does is it takes the difference of the guy on ui and uj and subtracts them and thinks of that as something on the intersection. So exactness at the second spot is that if I have guys on each different UI that agree on the overlap, I get a section on the whole thing. So let me just say, um, call this red star. Um, red star, the kernel is choosing uh, systems of new eyes such that new i restricted to u i intersect u j is equal to new j restricted to intersect u j. And well, the image is the things that are gotten by taking the new I and restricting a single global one form. So exactness is just the statement that these two things are the same. Uh, yeah, Paul. Um, so right now you're using this to try to, so you have um, tautological one forms pulled back on all of the UIs, right? Mm -hmm. And you're trying to glue one to get one for X right now? Yeah, uh, sorry, I've, I've let myself go down a bit of a rabbit hole. What I'm saying is, I want to show you that on the whole manifold X, there's a tautological one. Gotten by gluing from the UIs, right? Yeah, and how would I do that? Well, I'm going to tell you that I can cover my manifold with charts. I can yeah. construct a tautological one form on each one of those. And then they're all going to be compatible by this relation I had up. No, 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 so so my question is, what's wrong with just using partitions of unity right here? What goes wrong with the? Um, you know, probably you can make that work. Probably that's fine. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that's a problem. I mean, probably there's, a, you know, you have to kind of think carefully about what's happening on the overlaps, right? Um. So I, I think that will be okay, but it worries me a little bit. Okay, I was just wondering if like like there was some reason you were introducing this machinery. Um, no, I was just kind of, uh, I suppose you all probably would have believed me if I'd said, ah, it's enough to define it on the open subsets and then it all glues together. Um, sometimes I go on little disquisitions like this because I think it's worthwhile to know these things. Okay, so, okay, yeah. I, yeah. I was just, Sometimes yeah. people are kind of scared by, by this idea of a sheaf, and I'm just pointing out, well, I am kind of using that, but it's not such a scary idea. Okay. Um, well, okay, it, sorry, one, one more quick question. So, like, where, where does this differ from a partition of unity, I guess? Like, why would I use this over a partition of unity? Um, so the reason you would use this over a partition of unity, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, I think the partition of unity argument is probably fine. Um, you know, I, I'm a little more of an algebraic geometer than a differential geometer. So it's not kind of the first thing that springs into my mind. Okay, um, yeah. And, you know, there's just some small amount of Right, if you have a partition of unity argument, then you have to kind of think about what happens on you know all possible different kinds of overlaps, right? 
Okay. And in fact, you know, somehow on the overlaps, you know, you're just taking a bunch of the same one form mm -hmm. and like doing some weird averaging procedure weighted by the partition of unity. Right. You, you, right. you know, you're applying that averaging procedure to a bunch of copies of the same thing. So mm -hmm. like that averaging procedure is not actually telling you anything. Right. So somehow like, I guess my point is if an object is genuinely canonical, sometimes you'll also get this called the canonical one form, mm -hmm. but like a partition of unity argument. I mean, it probably works, but it, it hides what's actually going on. Okay. Right. Because a part of partition of unity argument is designed to take things that don't match up and get them to match smoothly. Okay. Right? So okay. It isn't really helping you that much if you, if the things already match. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that would also be a valid way to do this. All right, so we've reduced to constructing this on open subsets of Rn, and there you can just write down coordinates. So maybe I'll actually put in a, a title of some kind. Now, assume we are, assume x is Rn. So on Rn, of course, I have the standard coordinates, which I'll call x1 up through xn. And then on the cotangent space, there are dual coordinates, which I'll call c1, xn. And actually, maybe one of the harder parts of processing what's going on here is what do these dual coordinates actually mean? Well, when I have an element of the cotangent bundle of Rn, then I have a point, you know, which I'll just uh, denote x underline. And then I have a cotangent vector at that point. And there are various ways to write that. What the Cs are is they're the coefficients of the derivatives, or sorry, the, yeah, the differentials of the coordinate vectors. So I'm writing this covector at this point as C1 dx1, C2 dx2, plus etc. Cn. Right, so every one form can be written, you know, these differentials are a basis of the cotangent space. So I can write any, any cotangent vector as some coefficients in front of those guys. And the C1 up through Cn are those coefficients kind of thought of as coordinates themselves. All right, so I can think of those all together as coordinates on the cotangent bundle, and I can write down this one form. And, you know, somehow always the kind of confusing thing about these tautological things is, well, we, you know, things start looking tautological if you try to write them out. So it looks like I've written exactly the same formula that I had up above, but now I'm thinking of it as a one form on the cotangent bundle. So, let me just emphasize this point. This is one form on the cotangent bundle. All right, and if you kind of think through how everything transforms, you'll see that uh, this one form is actually invariant under coordinate changes. Um, and it's tautological essentially because it looks like the same formula as this one I gave for uh, this one here. But right on, on this line, I'm thinking of the C's are numbers. 
right? I'm thinking of one particular cotangent vector at one particular point. So the CIs and the XIs are, are numbers. Um, whereas here, the CIs are functions. Yeah, I won't, won't try to write that because I don't have space, but the, exactly in saying it's a one form on the cotangent bundle, CI is a function on the cotangent bundle. And I'm using it as a coefficient in front of the one form dxi. Um, you can also say this in, in coordinate independent terms, which is that the map from the cotangent bundle back down to the base induces a, a pullback map of cotangent vectors. And I think of C as a cotangent vector and pull it back. And that's just kind of another way of, of explaining what this formula means. All right, any questions? Yeah. Um, the two formulas that you have here, the one form of the cotangent bundle and then the formula above, the distinction there is the first one is just, it. we have a distinguished point. So we have this formula for every single point, but the second one is for the whole thing. Is that right? Um, yeah, the, the second formula is describing a one form, right? Whereas this first formula is describing a point and I'm telling you how to find uh, okay. to that point, right? Okay. So maybe a, maybe a better way to write this would have been to say like, okay, here are A's, here are B's. Okay. And when I, So I want coordinates on T star of Rn. So I've got this point. Um, when I apply the coordinate Xi to this point, what it spits out is Ai. When I apply the coordinate Xi to this point, what it spits out is Bi. Right, so they're not showing up here. So maybe another way to say this is um, CI applied to, you know, A, and then uh, let me use. Um, See uh, beta. So I'm just using beta as a symbol for a cotangent vector here. What I do is I take the pairing between the tangent vector ddxi and beta. So that's kind of a, a more abstract way of writing what this CI is. It comes from uh, a one form is exactly something that spits out a number when it runs into a vector and the vectors it runs into are the directional derivatives along all the coordinates. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, so, okay. So now we saw that there, there is this uh, topological form, but what does this exactly say about the space that has uh, this structure? Uh, about the cotangent bundle? Well, um, I assume that there might be something more general than the cotangent bundle that has this structure, but for the cotangent bundle, in in particular, 
what's the information we get from this existence? Um, well, I'm going to use this one form. That's uh, right. So the, if you look at the next line, so I'm, I'm not sure I, I know exactly what you're asking, um, but I'm, I'm going to use the existence of this one form. Um, and so for me, that's the point that um, this is something that sort of comes purely out of the cotangent structure, in particular is coordinate independent. And now I'm going to use it to make a symplectic structure. So, right, everything we've done thus far hasn't involved any symplectic geometry, but the next line uses this to, to construct an interesting example of a symplectic structure. All right. Um, we're now coming up on an hour. Do people want to take an actual break? I don't know. Sort of a, a long time to be going, but I'm okay. Maybe I'll just take a slightly longer than usual pause to see if more questions show up. Uh, ben, uh, I just have a notational clarification. So this line where you write alpha is some T star pi of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I read it in a, a more not familiar notation, this is supposed to be the pullback of the pullback of the push forward of Pi or was it? I... It's so what this what this is saying is I'm going to define the one form at alpha. Well, it's a section, so I can tell you a cotangent vector at each point of the cotangent bundle. Yep. X C that's a point of the cotangent bundle. So I need to tell you a covector at that point. The covector is. Think of C itself as a covector on the on the base, pull it yes. back. So that's yeah, that's what this equation here. Uh yeah, so I'm pulling back uh the covector uh at base point X using that map, but that map is that map is constructed out of projection map yeah. of the bundle, and then what that T the star thing. So I mean the the so that's the name I'm giving this pullback map mm. because it's the induced map on cotangent spaces. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to think about what happens in coordinates because it looks to me that in the level of coordinate system, right? It 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 looks to me that I have a projection map, and then I'm doing some. I take like partial derivatives of stuff like the Jacobian of stuff and then I have to invert some stuff. No, you don't have to, um, right? On the level of, of coordinates, I mean, that, that's this formula. Right, so the one forms dxi on the cotangent bundle of Rn are pulled back from Rn. Right, so there's a one form on Rn called dx1, dx2, etc. Sure. And when I pull those back to T star of Rn, they're still called dx1 up through dxn. That's part of what's confusing here, right? That in this formula, these dx1s up through dxn's are representing one forms on Rn. In this formula, this in formula, they're representing one forms on the cotangent bundle that are pulled back. Okay, so one of them is like just the xi, but with components zero on the on the on the fiber side, while the other one is just this one. Yeah. So, you know, this is sort of saying, okay, the point, right? If I'm at x c and I do this operation of think about c as a cotangent vector at the point X, the formula is going to be this guy. Yeah, I see, I see. So it's like it's like you have a, you're comparing like two vectors there. One of them is twice as long, but half the coordinates are all zeros or something like that, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, I'm slightly uncomfortable with that because, but yes, I mean, the DCIs up through DCN don't show up. Those yes. are valid one forms on the cotangent bundle of Rn, and they don't appear here. Yes, yes, okay, that makes sense now. Um, yeah, the, the reason I'm slightly uncomfortable with the like vector twice as long is, you know, there isn't a, in, the tangent in the cotangent bundle to the um, sorry in the co the cotangent space to a point in the cotangent bundle mm -hmm. there's a defined direction a, a subspace which is the stuff that's parallel sorry that restricts to zero on the fiber mm -hmm. but there isn't a like defined base direction yeah basically there's no canonical horizontal direction I guess is the exactly. Um, so, you know, somehow choosing the coordinates on Rn kind of forces one. So when you're on Rn, there is one, but it's not a coordinate-independent thing. Right, right, right. Okay. Or is this map this coordinate? Okay, sorry. Uh, let's let's pull ourselves out of that rabbit hole, and I'll just say, okay, we at great cost have constructed this one form, and if I take its exterior differential, and for whatever funny conventional reason, put a minus sign in front of it, what I get is a two form. And again, if I write things out in coordinates, it's gonna be dxi wedge dxi. Um, and the reason that the order swapped is that minus sign. And that is a symplectic form on the cotangent bundle. That's coordinate independent, all this good stuff you know, natural under open embeddings or even look, local diffeomorphisms. Okay, so let's actually check the conditions that a symplectic form needs to satisfy. Uh, obviously it's two form, it's a good start, right? The exterior derivative of one form is by definition a two form. Uh, because it's the exterior derivative of something, if I take exterior derivative again, I get d d alpha, and that's zero. So that's good. It's closed. And we can check explicitly that it's non-degenerate. So if I have some vector, again, this I this is a local property, so I can do it on Rn. If I have a vector on the cotangent bundle of Rn, when I contract it with the symplectic form, I get a non-zero one form which is what I need to check non-degeneracy. There's no vector such that when I stick it in, I get pairing zero with everything else. Okay, great. So we now know about an example of a symplectic manifold. Wonderful. And this is definitely one we'll, we'll come back to and talk about more, but especially because time is late, I wanted to talk about the other topic I wanted to cover today which is Lagrangian submanifolds. So um, the kind of linear algebra side of this, you'll do more of on your homework. Um, so I, I'll go by that a little quickly, but we can always talk about it more. Um, so I'm gonna step back for a moment from symplectic manifolds and talk about symplectic vector spaces instead. So remember that now means that this omega is a bilinear form. So it's a constant symplectic structure, or a linear. All right. So in such a vector space, a Lagrangian subspace is a half-dimensional subspace on which the bilinear form vanishes. So no two elements of that subspace have non-zero pairing under the bilinear form. Uh, an equivalent way of saying this is that y is equal to its own symplectic orthogonal. So this is something you'll, you'll do more about on the homework, but whenever I have a subspace y, I can look at the elements of my vector space, which have pairing zero with all elements of my subspace. 
So if I were using a inner product, this would be the usual definition of orthogonal complement. Um, so I'm just applying that in a straightforward way to this bilinear form, which isn't symmetric anymore, it's anti-symmetric. And so while for a positive definite bilinear form, symmetric, um, nothing can be, you know, the intersection between a subspace and its orthogonal complement is always trivial. For symplectic forms, you can have all kinds of stuff um, in the same way that you can with symmetric bilinear forms over the complex numbers. In particular, you have subspaces which are equal to their own symplectic orthogonal. All right. And another good way to think about this is we discussed that whenever I have a symplectic vector space, I have a basis that where the basis vectors come in two flavors, which I called E's and F's. And I only have non-zero pairings of an E with an F. Any E with itself or any F with itself is trivial. So in that situation, the span of the E's and the span of the F's are Lagrangian subspaces. So maybe I should have said that even before I said this. Um, We'll make a note over here. In particular, span E1 up through EN is Lagrangian. But even more than that, every Lagrangian subspace shows up this way for some such basis. So if I have a Lagrangian subspace, I can construct a basis with E's and F's that have the standard form of the symplectic structure where Y is the span of the E's. So again, it's half the basis vectors, so it's half dimensional and the symplectic form vanishes because um, the e, EI with EJ always has not inner product, but pairing zero. Um, and with a little bit more work, you can think about what's the symplectic orthogonal to the E's, the span of the E's. Well, nothing involving an F will be in there because that F will have a non-zero pairing with an E. So you can also pretty easily check that this guy, the span of the E's is equal to its own symplectic orthogonal. Um, and as I say, the proof of that will be a homework question. Uh, it's not hard, it's just uh, it's a little bit of linear algebra, but it's linear algebra that it's like good for your soul to do yourself. Um, I'm sure it's easy to find a proof out there somewhere, but um, it's not too bad. All right, so you'll, symplectic subspaces of, of symplectic vector spaces, sorry, Lagrangian subspaces of symplectic vector spaces. There's sort of a whole page of homework on I'm not going to go into those in, in huge, huge detail, but it is a, it's an important idea. And then once we uh, have this notion for symplectic vector spaces, we can then define a notion of the Lagrangian submanifold. So that's a submanifold of a symplectic manifold whose tangent space at each point is a Lagrangian subspace of the tangent space. Um, and uh, Joshua says, can we extend this to get a transverse foliation? Uh, uh, certainly you can always try. So he uh, asks, uh, can you extend this to get two transverse foliations of a symplectic manifold by Lagrangian submanifolds? Uh, well, that can happen. Um, the, there's no kind of, uh, there's no theorem saying that will happen. And uh, generally it won't. Um, you know, there are a lot of Lagrangian submanifolds out there that there's no kind of obvious way to extend to um, foliations. Uh, for example, if you have a two dimensional symplectic manifold, which is just a manifold of the volume form, any one dimensional submanifold will be Lagrangian. So, uh, you know, certainly there's lots of interesting topology in 
can you take a surface and put two transverse foliations on that by one manifolds? And sorry, was there a start of a question somewhere else down there? Yeah, I'm just seeing the, the images of all the people who raised their hands at some point. Um, all right, another way to say this is a submanifold is Lagrangian if it's half dimensional, that's required because a Lagrangian subspace is always half dimensional and the pullback of the symplectic form to it vanishes. It's kind of a useful way of thinking about what's going on, that the pullback of the symplectic form is zero. So as I say, this is an important notion. Let's actually try to find some examples of it. And this is one of the ways that knowing about cotangent spaces uh, pays off is now I can actually talk about examples. So whenever I have a one form, I can think of it as a section, a map from M to T star of M. And that's always an embedded submanifold. And in fact, if you think for a moment, it's an embedded submanifold, which is half dimensional. So it's the right kind of submanifold to be Lagrangian. You might ask, is it Lagrangian? Well, I think it would be kind of too much to hope that it always is. In fact, what happens is it's Lagrangian if and only if the one form is closed. All right, um, it's a pretty simple proof because it's half dimensional. The thing we need to check that it's Lagrangian is that the pullback of the symplectic form is zero. Well, by our universal property, the pullback of the tautological symplectic form is our original one form. So the pullback of the symplectic form is uh, actually minus, I think I'm missing a minus sign here. Uh, yeah. Oops. The pullback of the symplectic form is minus D of our one form. So, uh, that's zero if and only if dxc is equal to zero. And this is something that happens quite often. You know, you can use some sort of object to construct a, a half dimensional submanifold. It's hard to make kind of universal statements here, but it's kind of a common thing that that submanifold is. Lagrangian if and only if the original thing you put in has a nice property. Um, one good example is when the one form itself is zero, then I get what's called the zero section of the cotangent bundle. So for any vector bundle, there's a section which just send every point to the zero in the vector space over that point. That's called the zero section. So it's a copy of the base inside the vector bundle. And that's always a Lagrangian submanifold. Uh, similarly, if I look at a cotangent fiber, that's a perfectly good submanifold of my cotangent uh, bundle. And when I pull back the tautological one form to that guy, I get zero already. Right. If I go look at my formula for the, uh, yeah. if I look at my formula for the tautological one form, all of the one forms dxi, I'm sorry, dxi becomes zero when I pull back. So this alpha pulls has pulled back, which is zero. So in particular, the symplectic form vanishes there. And again, it's half dimensional. It's the same dimension as my original manifold. I'm supposed to be renaming X. And the symplectic form has trivial pullback there, so it's symplectic. This is actually kind of two extreme cases of one of the most important examples of a Lagrangian submanifold, which is what's called a co-normal bundle. So given a submanifold of my original base space, which I should be calling X, I can look at all the points in the cotangent bundle such that 
the point and the base is in my submanifold. And the covector, should be using red, the covector is in the perp to the tangent space to my submanifold. Right? So in the tangent space, a submanifold will give you a subspace. which is the tangent space to the original manifold. Oops. And the cotangent bundle that ends up dualized. So there's this standard uh, exact sequence. You'll see, I have the tangent space to my submanifold, my tangent space to the whole manifold, and then the quotient is what's called the normal bundle. Um, yeah, I should include the normal bundle to S. And so the cotangent space has a dualized version of this sequence. Where, oops. I have here zero, the cotangent bundle, the covector space of S, the covector space of S of X, and then the co-normal bundle. Um, which is just going to be the perp of the tangent space to the submanifold. So this is a very important example. And you can check that it's Lagrangian. You know, there are various ways to do it. Again, the tautological one form actually pulls back to zero on it. Um, I think the easiest way to do this is to choose coordinates so that your submanifold S has the first K coordinates as coordinates of it, and then extend that to a coordinate system on all of X. And then it will be relatively easy. Um, but it's, you know, just, just think about the case where it's a vector space, where my, my ambient manifold is a vector space and S is a subspace. And of course, a general manifold and submanifold always looks like that locally. And since all of this is coordinate independent, I get to choose the best coordinate system I possibly can. All right, and I should say, um, so again, my, my zero section and my uh, fiber are examples of this. So the zero section is the cotangent bundle to the whole space. So I think of the whole space as a submanifold. No covectors have are perpendicular to its tangent space. So I just get only the zero covector. So I get the zero section. On the other hand, T star at X of X, well, that's the conormal bundle to the point X thought of as a submanifold. So now that has trivial tangent space. So everything in the cotangent space is perp to it. And then all the other examples you might find kind of or somewhere in between where you have an actual proper submanifold. So this is a really important source of Lagrangian submanifolds. Any questions? So I, uh, I didn't have much time for them today. I'm sure we'll come back and, and mention this concept many times. Lagrangian submanifolds really are probably the most important notion in symplectic geometry. Right? We sort of had this little bit of discussion at the beginning of the last class of you know, why are symplectic manifolds an interesting thing. And actually, one of the reasons is they pick out this special class of submanifolds that play a really important role. Um, and there's even this, uh, what I think is usually credited to Alan Weinstein, Weinstein's Lagrangian creed. 
which is everything is a symplectic uh, Lagrangian submanifold. Everything that shows up in symplectic geometry can somehow be expressed as the a Lagrangian submanifold. So, for example, uh, one one example of this: consider two symplectic manifolds M and I just want to mention kind of two constructions I'm going to use. I can take the symplectic form and negate it. That's called the opposite symplectic structure. So um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that at the moment. And when I take the product of these two manifolds, I can put a symplectic structure on the product, which is pull back the two symplectic forms and add them. So basically what I'm doing here is the co -tan the tangent space to the product is the direct sum of the tangent spaces to the two manifolds. And I just put the symplectic form on the two tangent spaces separately and have them ignore each other. And the reason I introduce these is I actually want to look at the Cartesian product m times n as a symplectic manifold but I'm going to do this funny operation where I put the opposite structure on N. So that's a, a perfectly good symplectic manifold. And if I have a diffeomorphism from M to N, the graph of that is a submanifold of M times N. All right. So yeah, this submanifold, this is all the points of the form, a point in M, and then its image under the diffeomorphism. So it's a copy of M inside the product M times N bar. And you can check. So this is another manifestation of this submanifold will be Lagrangian if the map is nice. Um, if and only if phi is a symplectomorphism. So the submanifold being Lagrangian is the same as the map being a symplectomorphism. Uh, and I'll address uh, Jack's question. Uh, for, oh, well, I'll, I'll get to all the questions in the chat in a moment. Let me just go through this proof. So this guy's half dimensional. M and N are diffeomorphic, so they have the same dimension. Um, so a copy of M will be half dimensional. And this graph has projections down to M and N such that if I compose them this direction. So I do pi one inverse, map from the graph to n is an isomorphism, followed by pi two, I'll get this diffeomorphism of B. So being a symplectomorphism is about the question, what's the difference between the original symplectic structure on M and the pullback of the symplectic structure on M? Well, I'm going to pull that back to the graph. I'm pulling it back by diffeomorphism, so that won't change whether it's zero. But I can now use this formula to re-express things. So pi one of the symplectic structure on M, that's just what it was before. But when I pull back the pullback of the symplectic form on N, I get the pullback of the symplectic form of uh, an N by pi two. And the sort of important step here is to recognize this right-hand side, that's the pullback of the symplectic form on all of M times N opposite to the graph. And this minus sign is why I wanted N opposite, because I need that minus sign to show up. All right, so I have this equation. The left-hand side measures whether the map phi is a, diff is a symplectomorphism. The right-hand side measures whether the graph is Lagrangian. And so, because they're equal, well, the map is a symplectomorphism if and only if the graph is Lagrangian. So sorry, let me just look at the... Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, Stefan had commented that there's a nice physical interpretation of being Lagrangian. Uh, certainly that's true. Um, I mean, again, Lagrangian, it's, it's a property that comes up quite often in physics. Um, one way I've heard this sort of expressed as the kind of correct 
when you choose uh, boundary conditions for a, you know like an initial value problem, you should always choose them to be in a Lagrangian submanifold, right? So you know, for example, often hear that, oh, well, you can either fix the position and leave the initial velocity unknown or leave the initial position unknown and leave the velocity and fix the velocity or, you know, um, there are these, uh, yeah, different, uh, yeah, I'm gonna mess them up if I try to remember the words, but there are all the kind of boundary conditions you want to think about in physics exactly involve being in a Lagrangian submanifold. Um, an example, right, fixing the momentum or fixing the position. Um, and okay, we're <laughs> they're having the discussion in chat uh, because the time evolution in a phase space preserves the symplectic form. It also preserves a submanifold being Lagrangian because Lagrangian is a property that's defined using the symplectic form. So the last little bit of what I had here is just kind of uh, philosophy. One of the kind of annoying things about symplectic manifolds as like a category, right? As, as a mathematician, I want to think about everything in terms of categories. Well, symplectic manifolds is, is not a very good category. Because symplectic forms are always non-degenerate, if I have a map and I pull back a symplectic form and get a new one, that map has to have been an immersion. It has to have been injective on tangent spaces, which rules out like a lot of interesting maps out there in the world. So somehow asking that the pullback of the symplectic form on one space is the symplectic form on another one, it's not a very good condition. It's fine for to get the actual notion of isomorphism, but to get any interesting maps, it's not a good choice. So instead, kind of the, the right way to look for morphisms between symplectic manifolds is to look at Lagrangian submanifolds of their product, but with one of them given the opposite structure. Um, for whatever philosophical reason, I decided it would be better to do n bar, but right, doing n bar just negates the symplectic form, so it preserves being Lagrangian. So that's somehow the right, right way to come up with a morphism from M to N and what kind of should be the category of symplectic manifolds. Um, that's not really a category because you can't compose such things. So somehow they're kind of morally should be such a category, but it doesn't really exist in the, the usual strict sense of category theory. Um, but it's, it's a useful idea to keep in mind. One kind of you know, useful point is that means a map from a point into your manifold is a, is a Lagrangian submanifold. So somehow Lagrangian submanifolds are the right notion of points in symplectic geometry. And um, another kind of interesting thing to keep in mind is if you have a smooth map from a manifold to another manifold, and again, I'm not making any assumptions about embeddings, any smooth map, there's sort of a, a nice Lagrangian submanifold of the product of the cotangent bundles that somehow should make um, things work. Um, and so this, this guy, it's sort of, it should make X goes to the cotangent bundle of X into a functor. Um, that's not really the case because again, this isn't really a category, but every time you would kind of expect there to be a morphism between symplectic manifolds, one of these Lagrangian submanifolds of the product shows up, even if a map doesn't. All right, that's really a little bit of philosophy. Josh had asked, could composition be remedied with some sort of weak categorical structure? Um, the short answer is it's really complicated, not really, but sort of. Um, so the, the problem is there's just no object to be the composition of these guys. So 
there is a sort of fix where you, whenever you try to do a composition that doesn't work, you just say, ah, well, that's too bad. I consider this composition as a formal object. And then you can build a like higher category where you define morphisms between those. Um, but it's, it's a pretty complicated story. Um, and I don't really know what its uh, current technical status is. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, one of the things that's a, it's a beautiful idea and there's some interesting things that come out of it, but it's, it's very technical and difficult. All right. Any so I know I went by this uh, stuff about Lagrangians quickly. There is a homework set about them that will help you kind of think through, especially in the linear case, how they work. And they will definitely come back and we will think about them more. All right. And I will stop recording.